threatening, hazardous, with havens of grace and love. But Sartre goes beyond this. We do not arrive at a fundamental awareness of ourselves by simply being more profoundly conscious, as, say, in a mescaline-induced vision. No, we do this by our actions. And such choice and action takes place not in any trance of heightened awareness, but in reality. On the street, in a town, in the midst of a crowd, a thing among things, a person amongst people. For Sartre the fundamental is consciousness, not Heidegger's being. But consciousness cannot exist in a vacuum. It must be conscious of something. Here is where Sartre's philosophy becomes one of action. Unlike Heidegger, his main focus is not on the nature of being, but on its two aspects. These he distinguishes as the in itself, en soi, and the for itself, pour soi. The in itself is everything that is without consciousness. The for itself is the nothingness, the consciousness that is free and undetermined by the world of thingness or being. Like Heidegger, this too would appear ultimately to rely upon the Cartesian certainty of thought. But Sartre dismisses the notion that his consciousness is thought that results in knowledge, like that of Descartes. The for itself doesn't actually know anything. The point of view of pure knowledge is contradictory. There is only the point of view of engaged knowledge. The for itself is our purposive perception, which chooses and acts. As Sartre puts it, consciousness chooses itself as desire. In other words, consciousness actually creates itself through its choices. Sartre's entire philosophy hinges upon the freedom of the individual to choose. In doing so, he chooses himself. And this freedom remains, even when the individual finds himself in a historical situation that appears to hold him captive. Here the philosophy echoes the man, with his passionate belief in freedom and personal liberty. It also echoes the historical context. What could be more precious than freedom in a country under occupation by an enemy? Sartre's examination of and insistence upon the individual's ability to choose himself shows all the hallmarks of being written during the war. In this it is a brave philosophy of defiance. If I am enlisted in a war, this is my war. It is in my image, and I deserve it. No mention is made of the enemy. The enemy is acceptance of the status quo, of the given, going along with the crowd rather than choosing oneself. The enemy is the acceptance of other, i.e., all that is other than my individual consciousness. Yet Sartre also makes it plain that this is an absurd situation. The human enterprise, individual endeavour, is ultimately futile. There is no ultimate good, no God, no transcendent set of values against which all are or will be judged. Again, the echo of living under a vicious and immoral regime is plain here. Equally obvious is that Sartre's description of the individual human predicament transcends the particular conditions of Paris under Nazi occupation. Half a century later our predicament may appear less bleak and intense, but its lineaments remain identical, if we accept Sartre's atheism. Nowadays we may be inclined to a more optimistic view, but in the strict sense the human condition remains absurd and futile. These two words were to become existentialist favourites, to the point of cliché. Among the more trivial café philosophers of the left bank, they became a shibboleth. If you didn't consider life to be absurd and futile, you couldn't possibly be an existentialist. In light of this, it's worth examining these two key words a bit more closely. What precisely do they say about the lineaments and nature of our individual predicament? Futile comes from a Latin word meaning outpouring, i.e. overflowing or leaking from a jug to no purpose. Nowadays it tends to mean ineffectual, incapable of producing any worthwhile or lasting result. Absurd originally meant out of harmony, and now means not conforming to reason or custom. But the English use of this word has humorous connotations which are often entirely lacking in continental European usage. 
For Heidegger, the human condition was something of utmost seriousness, and even for Sartre, it was no laughing matter. Ironically, it is the pragmatic and humour-oriented attitude prevalent in the English-speaking world which would appear more in need of existentialism than po-faced continental seriousness. Our common-sense attitude frequently tends to a shallowness devoid of philosophic content. Existentialism's attempt to delineate the individual predicament can lend a certain background depth to the wafer-thin eye of modern Western self-understanding. Futility and absurdity can be self-enhancing as well as self-defeating. But back to being and nothingness. The enemy is the acceptance of other, insisted Sartre. Here Sartre was approaching the solipsism of his early attitude toward the war. Curiously, he was supported in this view by his contemporary Gabriel Marcel, who was in fact the first French philosopher to embrace existentialism. In Marcel's view, as far as the individual was concerned, society is expressible as a minus sign. Marcel was able to escape the charge of solipsism by embracing Catholicism. Sartre's individual was utterly alone. The other is the hidden death of my possibilities, asserted Sartre. But as previously mentioned, consciousness is consciousness of something. Consciousness, nothingness has an object, being. Sartre thus escapes the strictest solipsism, which maintains that I am the only thing that exists, and the so-called outside world is merely part of my consciousness. But Sartre's position still leaves his individual consciousness very much on its own out there. In the end, he is forced to resort to a convoluted argument of higher jargon. This boils down to the common-sense reasons we all accept for the existence of others in the private reverie known as our life. Now that others have been admitted to the other, Sartre can introduce a morality. Ironically, his morality has nothing to do with others. It is a suitably absurd morality for an absurd world. With no apparent irony, he maintains, all human activities are equivalent. Thus, it amounts to the same thing whether one gets drunk alone or is a leader of nations. If one of these activities takes precedence over the other, this will not be because of its real goal, but because of the degree of consciousness which it possesses of its ideal goal. Anyone who has brought up a child, become involved with a dope addict, or felt the need to place everything on a sure thing in the Kentucky Derby, will spot at once the flaw in Sartre's heroically liberal argument for the equivalence of all human activity. Yet paradoxically his ensuing argument here makes utter sense of his seemingly ludicrous earlier assertion. In choosing what we do, we should be aware of what we are doing, and must take full responsibility for it. My aim should be to increase my consciousness, to become more self-aware and more aware of my predicament, as well as accepting responsibility for my predicament, my actions, and the self I create with those actions. If there is no such thing as ultimate good and evil, ultimate value, then no human activity is intrinsically better than any other. We must accept that they are indeed all equivalent. We choose to make one act better than another, and we do so by our own choice. This boils down to the very opposite of some casual, woolly liberalism where anything goes. With each choice I make, I am creating not only myself, but implying an entire morality, whether I like it or not. As Sartre indicated, this should be enough to make you think. Get smashed, or run for president. But be aware of what you're doing. This brings us to one of Sartre's key concepts, mauvais foi, literally bad faith, but perhaps more easily understood as self-deception. We act in bad faith when we delude ourselves, particularly when we attempt to rationalize human existence by imposing upon it meaning or coherence. This can be done by accepting religion or any set of given values. It also includes any acceptance of science, in so far as this attempts to impose an overall meaning on life. To act in bad faith therefore means to avoid responsibility for one's actions by shifting this onto some outside influence. Another key concept of Sartre's existentialism is that existence precedes essence. This means that a human being first of all exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, 
and only defines himself afterwards, according to Sartre. There is no such thing as human nature, because there is no all-seeing God to have a conception of it. A human being is nothing else but what he makes of himself. He exists only as much as he realizes himself. He is thus nothing more than the sum of his actions, nothing else but what his life is. Sartre's explanation of human behavior inevitably falls foul of the usual psychological interpretations. One has only to consider the concept of the subconscious, its influence on our actions, and its role in the formation of personality. Sartre attempted to overcome such objections by proposing his own existential psychoanalysis. In Being and Nothingness he uses this to interpret a variety of human actions. His main argument is as follows. What I am is nothingness, which is an absence of being. What I long for is the being that surrounds me, which I lack. Sartre argues that our desires and the actions we take are tributaries of this flow towards being. I desire the world. I desire to possess it, and indeed to be it. In a certain sense I actually become the objects I possess. Thus, by possessing something, my nothingness becomes being. This echoes the process by which my nothingness becomes being in the eyes of others. More than that, it serves to protect me from this reifying infliction by giving my nothingness something to shelter behind. Much the same thing happens when I destroy or consume something. I appropriate it and destroy its impenetrability to me. Such analysis is taken to its logical extreme with an existentialist interpretation of what happens when I smoke a cigarette, a lifelong two-packs-a-day passion of Sartre's. In his view, smoking is also an acquisitive and destructive action. My cigarette is the world. As I smoke it, I destroy it and absorb it. The fact that this may be destroying me is not even considered. This would be an abrogation of my responsibility for the world, presumably. My freedom is choosing to be God, claims Sartre, a choice which is manifest and echoed in all my actions. Lettre et le néant ends with yet another convoluted argument, which characteristically appears both philosophically interesting and spurious in equal measure. Every human reality is a passion. It attempts to lose itself in order to become being, at the same time becoming the in-itself which escapes contingency, the thing which causes itself, which religions call God. Thus the passion of man is the opposite of the passion of Christ, for man loses himself as man so that God may be born. But the idea of God contradicts itself, and we lose ourselves in vain. Man is a useless passion. Lettre et le Néon was published in 1943 in Nazi-occupied Paris. It attracted little attention beyond those who considered themselves philosophers. Fortunately, this latter group was, and remains, considerably larger in France than in any other country, with the exception of Ireland, where the entire population falls into this category. As a result, word soon began to spread, from the few who had actually read the book, to those who wished to talk about it, as if they had. Existentialism, with its handy nihilistic slogans, existence is futile, man is a useless passion, and so forth, soon swept the left bank. In 1945 World War II came to an end. The anti-fascist allies were victorious in Europe, but Europe lay in ruins. The futility of this absurd situation was apparent to all. Existentialism spoke of such things in the language of now. There was no such thing as ultimate justice, Millions had died, and those who survived had little else to believe in but their own individuality. France had been humiliated, and now had a need for heroes, preferably cultural. This was, after all, France. It was necessary to show that there had at least been heroic spiritual resistance to German barbarism. Picasso filled the artistic slot, despite the fact that he was Spanish, and Sartre filled the literary one. He had, after all, written a few articles for the resistance press. Under the pressure of popular acclaim, Sartre even went so far as to write a short book explaining existentialism in simple terms, called L'existentialisme et un humanism, translated as Existentialism and Humanism, Sartre and existentialism now became France's intellectual export to the world. 
Already the hero of the left bank, he now became famous among intellectuals everywhere. He even began travelling and giving talks about existentialism. The old religions had failed. This new religion of atheism and defiant despair precisely matched the mood of the time. Juliet Greco became famous singing existentialist songs in the cellars of the Latin Quarter, and Jean-Paul Sartre sat at his table in the Café de Flore with Simone de Beauvoir amongst people. For Sartre the fundamental is consciousness, not Heidegger's being. But consciousness cannot exist in a vacuum. It must be conscious of something. Here is where Sartre's philosophy becomes one of action. Unlike Heidegger, his main focus is not on the nature of being, but on its two aspects. These he distinguishes as the in itself, en soi, and the for itself, pour soi. The in itself is everything that is without consciousness. The for itself is the nothingness, the consciousness that is free and undetermined by the world of thingness or being. Like Heidegger, this too would appear ultimately to rely upon the Cartesian certainty of thought, but Sartre dismisses the notion that his consciousness is thought that results in knowledge, like that of Descartes. The for itself doesn't actually know anything. The point of view of threatening, hazardous, with havens of grace and love. But Sartre goes beyond this. We do not arrive at a fundamental awareness of ourselves by simply being more profoundly conscious, as, say, in a mescaline-induced vision. No, we do this by our actions. And such choice and action takes place not in any trance of heightened awareness, but in reality. On the street, in a town, in the midst of a crowd, a thing among things, a person. And this freedom remains, even when the individual finds himself in a historical situation that appears to hold him captive. Here the philosophy echoes the man, with his passionate belief in freedom and personal liberty. It also echoes the historical context. What could be more precious than freedom in a country under occupation by an enemy? Sartre's examination of and insistence upon the individual's ability to choose himself shows all the hallmarks of being written during the pure knowledge is contradictory. There is only the point of view of engaged knowledge. The for itself is our purposive perception, which chooses and acts. As Sartre puts it, consciousness chooses itself as desire. In other words, consciousness actually creates itself through its choices. Sartre's entire philosophy hinges upon the freedom of the individual to choose. In doing so, he chooses himself.